Shalom. This week we are reading the Torah portion of Ekev, the third Torah portion of the book of Devarim, Deuteronomy, which starts with verse 12 of chapter 7. The word Ekev, for which the portion is named, is the second word of the Parsha, but the first distinctive word. In this amazing and moving Torah portion, Ekev, Moshe continues his last will and testament, which is the book of Deuteronomy, and here in, in this Parsha, he conveys the blessings of obedience to God by following his commandments, as well as the dangers of forgetting, forgetting God, especially with haughtiness and self-aggrandizement. Parshat Ekev further instructs and prepares the people in the acquisition of the land of Israel, which is greatly praised in our Torah portion. Moshe also recounts the details of the making of the first and second tablets of the law, he reviews the incidents of the golden calf, he mentions Aaron's death, the Levites' duties, but interestingly, this Torah portion begins with a riddle, an implied riddle, and the riddle is, if the divine commandments, the mitzvot, could talk, what would they say? See, our Torah portion begins with the Hebrew words, which are accustomed, we are accustomed to translate as, and it will be, or it will come to pass, Akev, because you will heed these ordinances and keep them and perform, that Hashem, your God, will keep for you the covenant and the kindness that He swore to your forefathers. But this translation is forced. It's a matter of convenience, because the word Akev, here translated as because, doesn't really mean because, yet that's the only way it can really be read here, either as because, or if, or due to, and it can be read that way, and the word even in modern Hebrew can be used for that purpose, but this verse would have made more sense had it read, im tishma'on, and it shall be, it shall come to pass, if you hearken, without the insertion of the word akev, which literally means the heel of the foot. Now, Rashi is very bothered by this and states rather famously in the Torah world, what is the meaning of this? And it will be Akev because you will heed. So he says the following, he says, if you will heed the mitzvot kalot, meaning the easy commandments, the light commandments, which one usually tramples with his heel, in other words, which a person treats as being of minor significance, then Hashem, your God, will keep His promise to you. So, essentially, Rashi explains that the verse seeks to convey that the word ekev, heal, is employed here by the Torah because there is a natural tendency for a person to treat certain mitzvot, maybe the lesser mitzvot, as a trifling thing. That a person will take the major commandments, like stealing or murdering, don't murder, I guess, very seriously. But when it comes to certain minor commandments, the little ones, the light ones, well, a person naturally tramples them underfoot, meaning takes them for granted, doesn't view them as seriously, doesn't view them maybe as gravely, maybe takes a shortcut, or maybe takes them for granted, cuts corners, I don't know, just doesn't seem to take them as seriously. So Rashi explains the Torah is gently exhorting us, don't make that mistake, because you don't know the worth, the value, the reward of the commandments. In God's eyes, the little ones are worth just as much as the big ones, and for all you know, maybe even more. So, because, Akev, you will heed these ordinances and keep them and perform them even or especially the mitzvot kalot, the lesser commandments, lesser in your eyes, that Hashem, your God, will keep for you the covenant and the chesed, the kindness that is for to your forefathers, because you are careful to keep the ones that you might otherwise walk all over, then Hashem will reward you with the kindness he swore to your forefathers. Okay, well, this is serious business. Now, you may be familiar with the Gas Gadsden flag, a historical American flag with a yellow field depicting a rattlesnake coiled and ready to strike. Positioned below the rattlesnake are the words, Don't tread on me. The flag is named after American general and politician Christopher 
Gadsden, who designed it in 1775 during the American Revolution. So if mitzvot could talk, what would they say? Well, apparently some of the mitzvot would, some of them would certainly say, don't tread on me. But there's one very big problem. Which commandments are we talking about here? Which are these mitzvot that a man tramples with his heel? Which are the commandments that we treat too lightly, walking all over them like Nancy Sinatra's boots? The verse doesn't say. It's but an illusion. And Rashi doesn't say. Most opinions, the conventional wisdom, is that this is referring to one might inadvertently consider minor mitzvot like those that, let's say, we do very often. There's so much ingrained into our lives, become like second nature. Maybe we tend to do them by rote. They become routine, like our daily prayers or the blessings that we recite before eating things. They become so much a part of us. Maybe they don't seem so glorious to us. Maybe they just seem every day. So we might end up taking those things for granted and not giving them enough thought. If we become accustomed to patterns of behavior, we do run the risk of becoming lackluster and uninspired. That's why people study Hasidut and other inspirational Torah works, so as to constantly be rekindled and not fall into the greatest danger of all in serving God, complacency. Yeah, you could see it that way, but maybe it's different for each person. Maybe the problem is that each person in that individual's relationship with Hashem rises to a certain point, but then holds back, isn't willing to commit fully to the program. And after all, another thing our Parshat Ekev emphasizes several times is that the commandments are a package deal, one unit. In this regard, verse 1 of chapter 8 states and emphatically, the entire commandment that I command you today, you shall observe to perform. You have no right to pick and choose what's convenient, what you think is PC, or what you feel like doing. But the bottom line, what exactly these commandments are, voiced here by the Torah that we tend to tread upon, considering them minor or inconsequential, well, it's open to interpretation. So open up your heart in the deepest way. As you listen to this, what you're thinking right now, <laughs> What you think it might mean to you in your life, knowing yourself and your own struggles to serve God, you're probably right. But today, I want to go deeper. You know, there are always multiple levels of meaning, and they're all true. So open up your hearts again in the deepest way. The famed Rebbe of Kotsk, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Morgenstern, asked, how could Rashi even say this? The Kotzka Rebbe says it's inconceivable that any Jew would treat any of the mitzvot lightly and think of them as less important. After all, he says, everybody knows that we don't know the value and the reward of each mitzvah. So the holy Rebbe of Kotzk says, I'll tell you what Rashi means by an easy mitzvah, one that is trampled underfoot. He says, He's referring to the mitzvah of living in the land of Israel, which a person fulfills every time he walks four cubits in the land, literally tramples underfoot. And the holy Kotzka Rebbe opines that this indeed is Rashi's intention regarding a mitzvah that is trampled under the heel, quite literally. When we live in the land of Israel, then every day, just by walking along in the land of Israel, just by attending to our daily routine, nothing special, not thinking of anything specific, nothing too very scientific, just living, this is a great mitzvah. But one could, God forbid, really take living in Eretz Israel for granted. One might regard this as a mitzvah kala, a lesser mitzvah, because it's so easy, it looks so simple to fulfill. But you should know, he says, its reward is so great that Hashem will keep for you the covenants and the chesed that is swore to your forefathers for the mitzvah that we trample underfoot, the commandment of living in the land of Israel. Now, the rabbi of Kotzk's words are a great inspiration. The commandment of living in the land. The commandment to live in the land. And those who live in the land of Israel 
are able to fulfill this commandment countless times each day just by living their normal workaday lives here. And didn't the illustrious Vilna Gon stress that the uniqueness of the mitzvah of living in the land of Israel is that one, it's one of the mitzvot that a person fulfills with the entire body constantly. Now Moshe won't be joining the children of Israel in the land. We spoke a lot about that last week. But in Parshat Ekev, Moshe Rabbeinu sings the outstanding praises of the land of Israel. The qualities that he mentions here, the words are so deep and full of meaning. Level upon level upon level of meaning. And the more we study about the land of Israel, the more we begin to understand that it might look like another land in this world, but it's something completely different. Let's look a little bit at some of these verses and just scratch the surface. We'll just open up a little window in the praise of Eretz Israel. In chapter 8, the natural treasures of the land are enumerated in three verses in which the word Eretz, meaning land, is mentioned six times, beginning in chapter 8 and verse 7. For Hashem your God is bringing you to a good land, a land with streams of water and springs and underground water coming forth in valley and mountain. The second verse again mentions the word land, Eretz, twice. A land of wheat, barley, grape, fig, and pomegranate. A land of oil, olives, and date honey. The next verse states, A land where you will eat bread without poverty. You will lack nothing there. A land whose stones are iron and from whose mountains you will mine copper. Again twice. Finally, the Torah includes everything in a seventh usage of the word Eretz in the fourth verse, where we will read, you will eat and you will be satisfied and bless Hashem, your God, for the good land that He gave you. Famed Rabbeinu Bechaya teaches that the six mentionings of the word Eretz in the first three verses are an allusion to the six major climate regions of the world, all of which radiate forth from the center of the world, the land of Israel. Yes, kids, the world is divided into six climate regions, you can go look it up. The seventh use of the word, Rabbeinu Bachaya states, refers to the seventh zone, and this you won't find online. A climate zone unto itself, he says, the climate of Jerusalem, which contains and is a mixture of all the world's climates, as David writes in Psalms 48 and verse 3, fairest of sights, joy of all the earth. He explains the word nof, translated here as sight, Rabbeinu Bechaya says, this means the climate, that each climate differs according to its proximity to the sun, and thus passing between them can be unhealthy. But Jerusalem, he says, is made up of all of them. Therefore, its climate is wonderful. And thus the following verse states, and you shall bless Hashem your God for the good land. Then we find this expression, a land with streams of water, of springs and underground water coming forth in valley and mountain. Now the early commentators explain the meaning of this verse on a simple level as follows. In the land of Israel, those who dwell in the mountains don't have to descend to search for water down below, and those who dwell in the valley don't have to ascend to the mountains to search above. Everybody will find the water that they need in their own place. This great blessing is not to be taken for granted as self-evident. In the land of Israel, we need Hashem's constant mercy. There are no rivers here to irrigate the fields. The springs and underground sources of water are dependent on the rain of heaven. As the verse later states in the second, in the second portion of the Shema in chapter 11, it will be that if you hearken to my commandments that I command you today, to love Hashem your God and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I shall provide for your land in its rain for your land in its proper time, the early and the late rains, that you may gather in your grain, your wine, and your oil. The land of Israel, our sages teach, is like an irrigated garden. No, indeed, it doesn't need rivers to water it like the land of Egypt. In chapter 11, we read, for the land to which you come to possess it, it's not like the land of Egypt that you left where you would plant your seed and water it on foot like a vegetable garden. But the land to which you cross over to possess it is a land of mountains and valleys. From the rain of heaven it drinks water. A land that Hashem your God seeks out. The eyes of Hashem are always upon it. 
from the beginning of the year to year's end. The true meaning of these verses is that living in the land of Israel is living in the palace of the king. When you live in the suburbs, you don't go shopping that often. Keep your pantry well stocked with all sorts of stuff full of preservatives. When you live in the palace, king is right there. You get fresh food delivered every day. Meaning, open up your heart. The hashkacha, the divine providence over the land of Israel is much, much different than the divine providence that is exercised over the rest of the world. It's local. The eyes of God are everywhere, but not in the same way. And what is meant by the words, you shall not eat bread in poverty? On a simple level, everybody knows that poor people eat a lot of bread. It's cheap. But the land of Israel feeds its inhabitants in a very special way. You don't need to eat its bread for lack of something more substantial, because its bread is so delicious, it doesn't have to be eaten together with something else. Now, doctors will tell you, they'll say, don't eat too much bread, it's fattening. Not so the bread of Israel, our sages state. Totally good for you. Eat as much as you want. And it's spiritual. Overeating and indulgence generally bespeaks being too much, in, too much involved with physicality. Not so the bread of the land of Israel. No such concern. Eating its bread is a spiritual pursuit. Rabbeinu Bechaya, again, sees the Torah's intention here completely on the spiritual level. He says the Torah is likened to bread. As the verse in Proverbs states, Lechu lachmu belachma, it's Proverbs chapter 9, verse 5, Come and partake of my food and drink of the wine that I mixed, Hashem says. Open up your heart in the deepest way. Because he's teaching, Rabbeinu B'chai, that the hearts of those who dwell in the land of Israel will be wide open to the words of Torah, the very gates of the understanding of Torah will be open before them. As the sages state on the verse in Genesis, chapter 2 and verse 12, the gold of that land is good. They state that the secret of that verse is that there is no Torah like the Torah of Eretz Israel, and there is no wisdom like the wisdom of Eretz Israel. Thus, the explanation of you will not eat bread in poverty means you will not taste of the Torah of Eretz Israel in spare measure the very air of the land of Israel cultivates wisdom. Not so the wise men outside the land, for they lack these advantages and the good air. And they eat the bread of grief, he says, in poverty. Thank you, Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar. I always suspected that. In short, there are so many countless benefits, blessings, bounty, revealed, hidden, physical, spiritual, earth, heaven, water, bread, climate, name it. But here is where the heels come in again. Akiv, as we walk upon this land, there is a great danger of forgetting Hashem and a lack of appreciation when it becomes routine and living in the land is taken for granted. Regarding this pitfall, the verses in chapter 8 describe the bounty which God granted the children of Israel as we enter the land, and the Torah issues a warning, take care, lest you forget Hashem, your God, by not observing His commandments, His ordinances, and His decrees, which I command you today lest you eat and be satisfied. Your heart will become haughty and you will forget Hashem, your God. This danger of complacency. We must be intensely aware and mindful of the ground we walk on at every moment. Those who are blessed to live in Eretz Israel, and those who don't, those who don't see why they should be living in the land of Israel, how much more so should they examine that which they trample, that which they take lightly. Parshat Ekev is a gift from Moshe Rabbeinu, and it teaches us that Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, says, tread on me, but don't take me lightly. May the people of Israel merit to come home and bless Hashem for the good land that He gave you.